Good afternoon. Uh, it is Thursday, April 4th, and this is a joint session between the Education and Culture Committee and the Transportation and Environment Committees. Just talking with my co-chair, Councilmember Glass. I think this, this is our first time doing this together, so uh, excited to be together for uh, two very important issues. We also are joined on the Education and Culture Committee by Councilmember Albernaz. Uh, Councilmember Mink uh, is not present today. Uh, and then we have Councilmember Balcom and Stewart from the TNE Committee. Um, before we get started, and I just wanted to uh, send our condolences, not condolences, best wishes to the young person who was hit this morning, uh, making their way uh, in Damascus to school. That's literally what we're talking about today, how to make sure that those trips are safe. Uh, and uh, while that young person is in the hospital, we hear with non-life-threatening injuries, certainly underscores the importance of uh, what we're here today to do. Um, we are going to be discussing uh, student walking and biking infrastructure with, with partners that deal with these issues, MCPS, MC Department of Transportation, and the Planning Department. And then we will have a discussion with those same partners, including our Department of General Services on capital improvement programs projects, including the much talked about MCPS bus depot relocation. Uh, so we're excited to dive in. Um, just uh, before I turn it over to my co-chair, uh, this council and the previous council have done so much work to ensure that kids have safe routes to school. Uh, it's something that uh, I know has been a priority for me. I know it's been a priority for Councilmember Glass and for this whole committee and whole council. Uh, we've committed uh, to Vision Zero. We've committed in particular funding year over year to the Safe Routes to School program to speed up the analysis and the repair and, and building of infrastructure. Um, so it's going to continue to be a priority for us, uh, but we know we can do better. Um, the packet outlines that 12 to 16 percent of our students walk either to or from school. Just for context, that's between 20 and 25,000 students, most of them elementary age, walking to or in or from school every day. Uh, it's a significant number and obviously very important that we make sure they're safe. Uh, I've been visiting a lot of schools. I was recently at Sherwood Elementary uh, in, in, uh, in Ashton and off Route 108. And Principal Jefferson asked that I share, and I will, that the two-lane road outside the school is often backed up and that there has often been accidents in front or very close to the school limiting pedestrian access. Just an example of where issues we have problems across the county. Uh, and so all of us are committed to making sure our kids get to and from school safe. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to my co-chair, uh, and then we'll get started. Councilmember Glass. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Jawando. I'm, I'm glad that our two committees have been uh, able to, uh, to get together uh, to talk about this important issue, uh, underscored, as you noted, by the 12-year-old who was hit while walking to Baker Middle School, um, you know, Ridge Road and Oak Drive, there's no traffic light, there's no signage, there are no crosswalks. This is exactly what we're talking about and the need for this, this conversation. Um, and I'll also add a little more context that when the Transportation and Environment Committee had a session back in February uh, talking about the travel, uh, the planning department's travel monitoring report. Uh, there was a lot of information about kids, how kids are going to and from school, uh, and about some recommendations that the planning department made, which we will get into. Uh, it's in the packet, um, and Mr. Anbacher is here um, to talk about that. Uh, we, th we as a committee thought it was really important to meet with the Education and Culture Committee. Uh, and have this conversation so nothing is stovepiped, so that there is full coordination. Uh, and I know that there is, but we need to have this conversation as well, especially within context of, of the capital budget. Um, Chair Jawando noted um, some of the important data points about how, uh, how many kids are walking to and from school. Um, and, and I'll just add one more before uh, turning it over to staff and, and starting the, the official conversation. Our kids who are walking to school do not feel safe doing so. That is another reason we're here. Uh, high schoolers report, only 27% of high schoolers report um, being comfortable along pathways. 
and only 13% express comfort at crosswalks. So this entire conversation is how we get kids safely to and from school. Um, it is one of the most important things that we can do. We trust when we send our kids to school in the morning that they come back safely and educated. Um, and so I look forward to this conversation. Um, thank you, Chair Jawando, and if you want to turn it over to Ms. McGuire. Thank you. Uh, so I guess we can invite our guests down uh, who are here for this item. Uh, please come on down um, and we'll identify, everyone can identify themselves. I think we have, I'm going to just wait and see who comes down and we'll identify everybody. <laughs> I've learned my lesson about that yeah. sometimes. <laughs> um, and then I'll turn it over to you, Ms. McGuire, to tee us up. And I know there's a brief presentation, but why don't we have everyone introduce themselves and your your affiliation first. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Thank you for having us here and talking about Safe Routes Schools and Coordination. My name is Wade Holland. I'm the Vision Zero Coordinator with the Office of the County Executive. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Paylor. I'm the Chief of Traffic Engineering and Operations for Montgomery County's DOT. Good to see you all. Thank you. And Seth Adams, Associate Superintendent for the Office of Facilities Management for Montgomery County Public Schools. David Hansbacher, Acting Division Chief for the Countywide Planning and Policy Division at the Planning Department. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McGuire, turn over to you to TSA. <clears throat> Thank you. And um, certainly both chairs have, uh, have, have pointed out some of the many reasons that we're here and um, the conversations that have, of course, occurred in both committees. And again, it's very helpful to bring the group together today to have this conversation here. The packet um, outlines briefly some of the funding that is in multiple um, uh, areas of the budget. The funding is, of course, in both capital and operating and in all of the agencies that you see here today. And so that, <clears throat> pardon me, that interagency coordination is, of course, uh, the most critical element to really make effective use of those dollars and bring the efforts to uh, successful fruition. Um, we do, of course, also have our public safety partners here as well, and um, they can also uh, join us in the conversation. As you said, we do have a brief presentation just talking about the Safe Routes to School program, which again um, has funding both in DOT as well as um, a partner project in MCPS, which is the Improved Safe uh, Routes to School um, project and the Education Committee and the Council have just um, uh, signed off or made initial recommendations on in increasing the level of funding in that project across the six-year period. So again, just reflecting the continued increase uh, in efforts in these projects across across the board. So we can um, perhaps start with this conversation um, and then uh, dive into some of the other infrastructure questions that were raised. One of the um, questions that has been raised previously is about um, again, the infrastructure at schools, crosswalks, and the pieces that are off of school property, as well as um, bike racks and some of the pieces that are on school property. Great. Thank you. Mr. Holland, are you uh, leading us on? Okay, great. All right, so I think it would be helpful to have some baseline information. Again, it's only eight slides. We don't want to put, bore you to sleep with uh, too many slides. We just wanted to make sure everyone had a good baseline of basically the two major departments within Montgomery County government. Uh, that being MCDOT and MCPD that talk about and, and fund and implement our Safe Routes to School program. Um, so I'll kick it over to Mr. Michael Paylor to talk about the MCDOT piece. So thanks a lot. And so thank you again. So if, if you'll just go to the next slide, please. Uh, this slide talks about our particular role in, the, in our Safe Routes to School program. Uh, we want to improve walkability uh, through the sidewalk installation and certainly uh, making sure that these sidewalks and the crossings are uh, Americans with Disability Act uh, uh, compliant. Um, also, we're looking at uh, at these crossing locations aside from, from crosswalks or uh, other materials like sidewalks. We're also looking at traffic control device installation. That could be as routine as signs it could graduate up to traffic signals. So we evaluate these things in their appropriate context and then look to um, apply the appropriate solution. And again, the other thing that we also want to evaluate is whether or not the speed limits uh, in these areas are appropriately set based on context. And, and then, of course, um, the, the culture of safety, advancing that through our outreach and our communication and collaboration with uh, MCPS, uh, some of the events that we hold, um, 
uh, the youth ambassador for Vision Zero, uh, certainly engaging them with, with handouts and some fun things like um, uh, Walk to School Day, things like that, Walking Wednesday, some of these programs to continually get in the face of our, um, our school kids, our school children, and impress upon them the need for uh, safe walking and bicycling habits to school. Um, the second uh, part of the slide talks about our collaboration and coordination with other agencies. Um, as I mentioned with these school events, we collaborate with MCPS what and how and when, and they've been great partners in that. Um, also, as we do our walk shed assessments associated with our safe routes to school, we're meeting with school officials to get their input and insights on where kids are walking, where they're coming from, where they're going, what's happening on and off the school premises, those little back end of the school areas where kids tend to walk and, and trying to find those out, flesh those out and, and apply safety treatments there. And also collaborating with, uh, with the crossing guards and uh, MCPD. What types of things do they observe? They're boots on the ground for us. So we talk to them about the things that they observe and try to determine what other safety measures we can employ based on that input. And then also as schools are built, and renovated, we seek to uh, look at those plans to see what kind of circulation patterns are happening on school premises and how that affects the uh, uh, movement of vehicles and pedestrians and bicyclists off premises, and then try to find ways to, to get, um, uh, get improvements in place to address some of the, the conflicts that may arise uh, based on those uh, new improvements of the new schools that are um, uh, being constructed. You can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, these walkability studies that I made reference to, uh, we complete 10 to 20 a year. Um, I think there was someone on the panel that alluded to the magnificent work, and I know you, uh, <laughs> Councilmember Jawando, were um, instrumental in uh, getting us funding, uh, the additional funding, of, and so that we have $300,000 that we're applying to these walkability studies so we can get to these 20 studies a year. We've done, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 70, and we've got 130 more or so, those are kind of loose numbers. When we first started this, uh, this discussion back in 2021 and then subsequently had the additional funding, we had a little bit of a, 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 a darth in being able to process these. We had some personnel modifications, some changes in processes, and we had a slowdown in the amount of walkability studies we were able to process at that time. And since then, we're back on groove and we're getting those processed. So like I said, we've got about 130 to do. Um, and we estimate about, we've been estimating about 15000 per uh, as far as how much they cost us. So that settles us somewhere around $1.4, $1.5 million that we'll need to complete that that we're um, um, working through. Um, as mentioned here, we're looking at the, the, the infrastructure at schools, where people are going, how they're moving. These walkability studies account for that. And then, of course, I mentioned the coordination restatement. And we try, or we, we set these out in bins, what type of short-term improvements we can uh, employ, signs, crosswalks, and then medium to long-term solutions like uh, pedestrian hybrid beacons or hawk beacons uh, or traffic signals or some other uh, material improvements that might take a little bit of time and more money. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, sidewalks, again, another important aspect of this and um, certainly appreciate that we now, you know, for FY25 and, and increasing beyond that, about a million dollars a year that we uh, have at our disposal. And typically when we look at the spot improvements that include sidewalks or some other uh, material traffic control device installation, we look to, to deploy that million dollars. The, the challenge is when we're talking about sidewalk build out now, when we first started on this, I guess, I don't want to say it's a new phase, that's probably inappropriate to say it, but when we started on this new adventure back in 2021-22, we had adopted the mindset that we were going to look at uh, the need for sidewalks in communities and inform the communities that we were building sidewalks and then try to advance those because we saw the sidewalks as an imperative safety need. And when we sought to do that, we got a lot of community pushback and some of our sidewalk projects stalled and some of them were even um, repurposed. So we've had to change our approach and what we did, just so you'll know, we added another public informational or community meeting on the front end to actually go to the communities that in our priority list 
uh, were next for sidewalk consideration and, and really seek to ask what's going on in the community and find out whether or not they were interested in supporting sidewalk construction in their communities. And if they are and were, then we would begin the next step and advance the design and ultimately the construction of sidewalks. And if for some reason the community isn't interested in it and there is no uh, significant, and you know, again, that's, at this time it's not quantifiable for you all, but there were no significant safety issues, we would look at another prioritized school walk shed location and look to employ those funds there as opposed to losing the ability to spend those funds during the fiscal year. So that was a change that we've had to kind of absorb and, and think about and pivot just based on the community, um, the community feedback that we've been getting. Um, and Oakview Drive is one of the examples that we have here of a walkability study sidewalk and that whole uh, uh, the uh, Joanne Lillick Elementary School is one that we're still in that place where we sought to deploy sidewalks but there were some community concerns that we're trying to address and figure out what the best way to move that project forward is so so that's kind of how we've been, we've been looking at um, our safe routes to school and, and constructing these uh, uh, build outs for sidewalk gaps and other improvements. And again, I also mentioned this, this whole culture of safety that we're seeking to advance. Um, we do that through bike rodeos and things of that nature. The youth ambassadors, as I've mentioned, contests which have been very successful, our heads up and phone da phones down contest, and the whole walking Wednesday schema. So those are the ways, at least some of the, the visible ways that we're working to advance the culture of safety in the community. The nice thing is that we are accessing school children and teaching them what we believe are going to be lifelong skills in how they should be navigating on the network. The challenge for us is that when we look at the crashes, aside from some of the ones and the one that we mentioned this morning, there are a lot of grown-ups that are involved in, in these crashes. There are a lot of adult pedestrians that are um, involved in trying to expand our program to target those uh, that, that demographic at a higher rate is something that we're in the process of doing and intend to do so that we can get everybody and communicate the safety message and it, of course advance this culture of safety. Oh, I think if our police department partners want to come, you have a slide, so I think you got, we, we need you. So show this collaboration here. Thank you. Yes, got you. And, and while they're getting set up, I will mention another thing that we're collaborating on schools on in terms of that culture of safety is uh, um, having the county government and the county schools co-sponsor our first annual uh, safety day, which will be coming up in May. So we'll be hearing more about that, but uh, they're also a crucial partner. I'm also hosting it on the 850 Hungerford Drive uh, parking lot to, to host that. So we're excited to have that kick off with schools. That's great. Assistant Chief, you might, okay, no, so go ahead. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, uh, Captain Warren Jensen, Director of the County Police Traffic Operations Division. Um, so just to talk about um, our role in the Safe Routes to Schools, uh, obviously we oversee the Crossing Guard Program. Uh, we conduct studies, our school traffic safety unit conducts studies to see where we should be putting them. Uh, obviously we recruit for them. Uh, we try to fill vacancies in partnership with MCPS, who also helps us fill our vacancies, which we appreciate. Uh, we conduct automated traffic enforcement with the school bus cameras, uh, red light and speed cameras. We also deploy our central traffic officers, our motor officers, to uh, areas that are involved in the safe routes to schools to conduct enforcement and education. Uh, and we also provide traffic control for special events uh, around the schools. Um, we do coordinate, uh, as far as data goes, we provide our data to MCDOT and uh, Mr. Holland over here with Vision Zero. Uh, to kind of see how the collisions are, um, uh, you know, doing with the environment and the structures. Uh, we also work with public schools on the crossing guard pla placement, and we address the traffic safety concerns that are raised by the community and work with uh, Department of Transportation as far as that's concerned. Our, our two biggest roles, to, to be more concise, is the crossing guard program, uh, which is 183 crossing guards are authorized, which we have, I think, 175 of them filled now, and that's an ongoing thing. Uh, we have a recruitment going right now, and hopefully that's going to go well. Uh, and the second thing is the automated traffic. If I could add just one thing for, from our perspective, in addition to the central traffic officers that, that work the school zones when needed, 
uh, the, each district station has uh, either traffic officer assigned or patrol officers who will be designated to uh, conduct uh, enforcement or education along those roads because those road routes uh, in and around schools aren't typically the ones that are covered by the central traffic office. Um, and to clarify, I know both the chair and the vice chair mentioned that accident this morning involving the, the young uh, student. Um, that was at a marked crosswalk. Um, uh, there are two uh, intersections for Oak on Ridge, and the one on the northern end, which is where this one occurred, uh, has a marked crosswalk. It's also signalized. The other one is not. So. And that makes it even worse. Yes. Appreciate that, Assistant Chief Yamada, just to introduce you for, for everybody. No, no, we know who you are, but we want everyone else. The millions watching at home, we want to know. Um, is there anything else from you? From your... uh, no, sir. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Yeah, so just to, to wrap that up, so we talked about a lot of the work that we do for the existing school walk sheds, and also one of the priorities for today is talking about how we deal with any sort of larger new school construction or larger renovations. So one of the things that the county government is looking at in terms of our priorities for New or rebuilt school construction is obviously first safe access to, from, and within the school grounds, making sure how it connects with the existing and proposed networks. Uh, the ability to process those pickup and drop offs, making sure, as, as was mentioned in the opening, you know, if those lines are backing up into the roadway, that creates safety and traffic concerns, so making sure that the school grounds can process the amount of traffic that is, is ex not only expected, but should be accounted for when they uh, are building these schools or renovating these schools. Uh, as much as possible, the MCPS budget with, for that particular school when it gets renovated uh, should include any sort of traffic mitigation and ped safety that's on or along the frontage of MCPS. And if there's offsite improvements needed, there are different CIPs. We mentioned the pedestrian safety program. There's also the CIP for transportation improvements to schools that exist. So if there are offsite um, improvements, those also have existing CIPs that those can be placed in for that collaboration. Thank you very much. Uh, just, I don't want Mr. Mr. Adams to be left out from MCPS here. And if you have any comments you want to make, and then we'll turn to questions. I know my colleagues have a lot. Sure. So thank you, and I and I think this is absolutely a, a critical conversation, and one I think as we went through the MCPS CIP, uh, really needs to be prioritized. Um, you know, just as an example, we talked a, a little bit about CIP projects and how we integrate and how we coordinate. Um, you, you know, a one cross crosswalk with a signalized traffic light is about a million dollars. That's that's for Woodward High School. Um, so when we talk about the, the funding that's needed for sidewalks, we talk about the funding that's needed for these improvements, it's significant and it, and it truly does need to be prioritized. Um, we've started the, the coordination efforts with, with the planning office um, to meet ahead of projects. We're, we're continuing those efforts with DOT to figure out what we need to do in advance of, of individual projects. But this is just beyond just individual projects and more of a countywide um, effort that needs to happen. And I think, you know, we, we've been in many conversations over the years where, you know, we all know sidewalks are re required and a necessity. And they, and they are stopped because of, you know, opposition. I think we need to get to a point where it's a non-negotiable. You know, we need to move forward. We need to put these sidewalks in. We need to make it safe, safer for our students. And regardless, as we say, it's all really one big pot of money. So regardless of which funding it comes out of, you know, it just needs to be prioritized. We need to figure out how to make this happen and how to get it done. So I think the, the coordination efforts are, are in a really good place. It's really now about prioritizing the funding and really making some of those tough decisions to divert the funding to this critical area of need moving forward. Appreciate that, Mr. Adams. I mean, it, it's, I'm often struck we have the issue of we have people begging for sidewalks on certain streets, mm -hmm. I get that, and, I, and then, but then you have people that are against it in other places and how that, and to your point, if we just need, if it's a public policy imperative, you have the coordination, you know where you need it, you know where the crashes are, we need to do, get it done. Uh, Mr. Hansmark. Thank you. Uh, as at the planning department, there's a number of things we do in support of pedestrian and bicycle safety throughout the community, but also uh, the school. Uh, of course, master plans, you approved one just the other day uh, in the Tacoma Park area. Uh, master plans, we take really deep dives. We look at a whole number of things, of course, but transportation and safety are one. We rec make recommendations for infrastructure that will improve safety, whether that's putting in a bikeway or a sidewalk 
are helping to break up the street grid and to slow down the streets. We also um, make recommendations for target speeds. Target speeds are sort of the vision for how fast we want the road to operate. They're not always something that can be achieved right away, but that's sort of the target where we're trying to get to. Uh, and we also, uh, in some plans, identify new sites for schools. Uh, we review and approve development projects, so as part of that, we are reviewing the master plans, the recommendations in the master plans, and we're requiring developers uh, to put in place, again, the infrastructure that supports safe walking and bicycling. We also have the growth and infrastructure policy that the, the council will take up later this year. Um, we review capital projects, we review school projects, we re review MCDOT's projects throughout the process, but more formally, it's part of the mandatory referral process, and we look for consistency with recommendations and master plans. We review all the projects against uh, the Complete Streets the Design Guide, county standards, best practices. And then a fourth thing is data analysis. We have really, really deep data sets, and I think at the t and &E committee, uh, in February, we really had a deep dive into some of those de those data sets as part of the bicycle master plan, as part of the pedestrian master plan. We developed these abilities to analyze how safe and comfortable is it to walk or bike to every school, every library, every rec center, uh, most parks in the county, which at a high level uh, helps us to prioritize recommendations and, and investments. Thank you very much. So a lot to chew on here. We, uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Lukey. Thank you for, uh, for joining us. Um, so I'm going to ask a couple questions and we'll hold myself back and then turn to my co-chair and then we'll go down. Mm -hmm. I think I've got everyone. I'm assuming Councilmember Lukey, you'd like to be in the queue as well for next, next item. item. Okay, next great. Item. All right, Number wonderful. Well, we, 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 <laughs> love, we love that you're here. So we'll move okay. down after that. Um, one, just want to say really happy about the coordination. And I want to thank you, Mr. Hall, even just the fact that you worked with your colleagues to put together the presentation and have it just shows that you all are talking. And I think that's since I've joined the council, that is a mm -hmm. it's been happening, but it's at a happening at a level that's much higher. And, and I think you all acknowledge that. So really appreciate that. Um, so my a question about the priorities, you know, all of you mentioned this, like you have we have these lists of, you know, here's where we think is the highest priority. You know, you miss, mentioned, Mr. Paler, you know, I've, I've made it a priority in the whole council since 21 to keep giving you more money to do more walkability studies. But then also you, we have to, it's not enough to just have this, the assessment, we have to pay for the things that are actually going to improve safety, right? And you said oh, there's a million dollars there. So a question, I, my question is relating to, are all the priority lists talking to each other? Are they all the same? Um, and if if not how are we how are we balancing that and then the secondary question will be what's i, I want to have a better sense and i think the council needs a better sense of what is a what the demand what we really need to fund like you know how we need to move and and put us might not be able to do all at once but to put us on a plan towards achieving whatever those shared priorities are realizing we can't do everything it's a huge county 500 square miles 211 schools all those walk sheds, et cetera. So if anyone wants to comment, let's maybe start with you, Mr. Paler, but if others want to comment, please. Uh, thank you, Council Member Juwando. As far as the priorities concerned, and, and your first question was, are they talking to each other? I, I fully expect that they're not, and if they are, the conversation is limited. So when we look at priorities for um, how we establish, uh, we determine whether or not we're going to advance sidewalk construction at a school, we first start with whether or not that school is located in an equity emphasis area, and then we're taking a look at what types of roadway, what, what roadway network is adjacent to that school, and what is the demand, origin and destination for the students, what's the level of exposure and risk. So like I said, some of this stuff might be indirectly talking to each other, but I don't, I would fully say that there isn't, unfortunately, there isn't a, a direct correlation between how our priorities might align with plannings. Uh, so, so from a police standpoint, I can tell you that we do communicate with either MCDOT or MCPS. In, as in, and I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, we have a top 10 uh, violation list for um, bus camera infractions, yeah. and we communicate that back to MCPS. Mm -hmm. um, anytime there's a collision uh, in and around a school or involving like today, uh, we would communicate that with MCDOT in the sense of, 
hey, we didn't, I th we think the crosswalk is not placed properly, or we think we need some extra lighting, we would communicate that with MCDOT. Um, so there are those conversations going on, and then I'm constantly in contact, uh, either myself or Captain Jensen with uh, Wade Holland. And what's the mechanism for that communication? Is there like, do you all get together and go over, like, you know, is, is or is that just like an email? Or yeah, you, okay. yeah. A, lo okay. a lot of times it's just an email okay. in regards to a specific event. Got it. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll speak to the coordination. Coordination obviously can always be improved, but we are now holding, we have both a monthly meeting with MCPS, uh, with MCDOT, so there is the back and forth coordination, uh, if not monthly, if not more frequently. Um, and I guess I would also say, I, again, there is more work to do in collaboration and, and sharing of data and priorities, but I think we're getting there. Uh, I think we are. We have worked really hard over the past couple of years to sort of talk through and come to an agreement on a shared language for what those priorities are through projects like the Complete Streets Design Guide, uh, through the master plan development process. Um, so, so we are getting there, but there still is more work. I appreciate that, and and one of the things I'm hoping we can work towards, and sounds you know, is it would be great for us to have a, a, a document that was approved by all of you that had here's where we think we need to move and quickly you know like you know for example i you know the Sh principal jefferson at sherwood where does that rank on on the list of i i was there i lived near there i know it's a problem but i have no sense of where that ranks on the priority list realizing we need to have just a plan of action so i know you it would be great and then when we're funding uh dot you know on the walk shed analysis they're getting great data so I'm assuming they're sharing that back with you, but we could probably, it sounds like we could set up a little more formal way of doing that with the goal of, in my view, at least getting a list together that then the council, we could all work together through the budget process, CIP and, and otherwise, to start tacking it, tacking it off. So I would just maybe suggest that to, as something to follow up on. All right, I'm gonna, I, I have other questions, but I'm gonna pause there um, and turn to my co-chair. Great, thank you very much, uh, Co-Chair Jawando. Um, uh, appreciate this conversation. Um, appreciate uh, Director Conklin um, being here, and behind Director Conklin, uh, we have uh, Board Member Harris. Thank you very much for for being here as well. Um, so, uh, Mr. Holland, I think you hit the nail on the head when and and the purpose of this conversation when you said there are different. Um, funding avenues within the CIP and here we are trying to figure out what those different funding mechanisms are how they all work together to provide these safe routes to schools that's that's it and so glad to know that over the last number of years the the conversations are being had more need to be held um, and 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 that is a good thing I I'm, I'm curious a little bit um, I, I feel, I think we're going to venture a little bit between uh, oscillating between capital budget and some operating budget stuff because it's hard to distinguish between the two. Uh, but uh, according, to the, um, according to this CIP, uh, there is, and correct me if I'm wrong, $28.4 million for the Safe Routes program. Is that correct? You're talking about over the yeah, terminal. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Or is that that's the safe routes to schools specifically? And if we can't answer, that's part of the so, reason we're having this. Yeah, so right route. now there's, there's about six point four million dollars over the CIP for okay. the safe routes to school. Okay. Um, I recall reading in the packet that that I, I believe over the over the span of the CIP it was twenty eight point four. Could uh, that have been pedestrian safety, sir? Um, it very well might. We, it's all there for us to to see, um, but but yes, I'm hearing yeses, uh, and and also that it is DOT that funds the Safe Routes to Schools program. Correct. Yeah, that is correct. Right, and so as we are trying to figure this out, important to know which the lead agencies are, um, and from your perspective, let me ask an open-ended question. Um, and it really hits on, on 
on all of your different agencies. A new school is being planned or a revision is being planned. A new bus route is being deployed, uh, whether it has express lanes or is BRT. What are the conversations that are being had, hopefully they're being had, to uh, develop the strategies to get kids safely? Sure, maybe I'll I'll start and then others can can chime in. I, I think that's a, that's a great question, and it typically starts from the onset with a planning discussion, right? Obviously, we can't do anything until we have an idea of funding. But once funding happens, or once we have an idea of planning, um, you know, as we talked about, we have monthly meetings with the planning office. Every project, every everything that happens is looked at from a lens of how does it fit within the, the various master plans. It's not just a development, but it's pedestrian, it's bicycle, you know, all the various master plans in terms of what what is missing and then what needs to be added. Um, those reviews, obviously, from a planning standpoint, they have transportation reviews, they have a you know WSSC, all the utility pieces that are a part of it. Um, but we look at it in terms and context of what that looks like. Some of the other agencies do get involved, you know, particularly when you talk about transportation. Um, have a lot of state involvement. You know, uh, there, there's sometimes there's ne not necessarily agreement with what's the best approach to solve individual projects. Does it fit? Does it fit better within the master plan, or does the state have um, mm -hmm. rights or or, or uh, trump ability over you know what what we're doing and how we're doing it? So so that work does happen on the on the front mm -hmm. end. I think what you hear sometimes around some of the funding challenges is that. You know, we, we have ideas, we have a concept of what we want to do and how it fits within the master plan. Um, what we don't necessarily know is what are the impacts going to be. You know, what does it mean from a forest conservation? What does it mean from a stormwater management? How does it fit within all the other requirements we have as a county um, to make that happen? And again, I, I always go back to our Woodward project as a perfect example. We, we put in the, um, the breezeway across the front of the, the school. We constructed that. Um, at the same time, State Highway came in and put in their bike lane on, on the side. We had to redesign everything that we had, we had coordinated at the beginning, uh, new, new uh, traffic signals, new pedestrian crosswalks, new access points. So, so sometimes these outside agencies do get involved and, and cause some disruption with what we're doing, but, but these are coordinated up front, um, you know, particularly on the new projects. It's the existing ones that I think are probably a little more problematic. When they, when they, came, when they come up, you know, there's probably a variety of different solutions to solve the issue. And that's where a lot of times we sort of go back and forth is, okay, who's the lead agency on this? If it's off school property, does transportation take the lead? Is, you know, is, is there a combination between the two of us? Um, you know, I think that's probably more of the complexities of around just, just who's the lead and, and ultimately who, where the funding is going to come from you know, for that, because there are a couple buck, buckets of, of dollars that, that, that would be involved in something like appreciate, that. Appreciate that, Mr. Adams. I see Director Conklin has joined us. Yeah, thank you, Chris Conklin, Montgomery County DOT. I wanted to share a couple items. One, most of the safe, safe routes to schools work that we're doing um, is dealing with existing schools and the access to existing schools. So the programmatic work Michael described of looking at the walk sheds is really related to the existing schools and addressing deficiencies that have developed over the decades as those school facilities have been installed and changed and the uses of several school sites has changed over the years. So that's where the bulk of that energy is focused. The mandatory referral and development review components are where we coordinate with Mr. Adams in new school development. And there are still bumps in the road there, and we're, we've established some protocols with MCPS to be involved earlier so that we can try to address those specific access changes um, as new schools are developed or, or renovations occur. And, you know, we've talked about the Woodland Elementary School. That's a place where perhaps that coordination wasn't as strong as it could have been related to Brookville Road, and we've worked with MCPS to address those issues as that school open. We have other instances like that, but we're trying to get out of the point where we're dealing with the issue after the school project is well underway and have a strategy for those site circulation, site access, and nearby off-site uh, improvements that's in place and part of the program so that those things are in place when the school is open. Uh, we'll have a major challenge with Crown High School when we get closer to that uh, because that coordination, again, is not quite where it needed to be to get that work done, and that's another impetus for us to change that interaction, that protocol between 
the school capital project development and our response on the roadway side to make sure that we have what's needed when the new school opens because we don't want to be using those programmatic resources that are addressing issues countywide to be addressing issues that are with new schools or renovated schools that are immediately open because the needs are greater than we can accommodate within the programmatic resources. You also asked about, uh, Council Member Glass, about the transportation projects uh, and how they accommodate schools. And we have a complete streets design guide and that's important, but we haven't thrown away the context sensitive element of that. So when we're developing the planning studies and the project designs for transportation capital projects, we're looking at those land uses that are nearby and making sure that the designs respond to the needs of the surrounding community so that if a school is an element of that, the walk shed is an element of that, we're looking to make sure that the, the new facilities that are proposed are accommodating those needs in the transportation projects. Uh, and I see Mr. Ronsbacher wants to speak to the zoning aspect. Uh, planning aspect. To the planning aspect, no, the, the, the planning department, of course, has a lot of thoughts on, on schools, on the, on the placement of the school in the community, on the placement on the site, on the design of the school. These things have a lot of uh, bearing on um, both safe access and how likely it is someone is to walk or bike to school. Um, I think a lot of times you'll hear us pushing for smaller school sites embedded in neighborhoods. Those are oftentimes um, more expensive than uh, sites on larger tracks outside of the communities. But all of that really weighs into uh, how, how safe access to the school is and how likely people are to walk and bike to them. Uh, the placement of the school. The school is um, placed right on the sidewalk. Again, that encourages people to walk there or to bike there. If it's set back a little ways with maybe a parking lot that students will have to traverse through to get to the, the school, that also has, has a bearing on safety. So a lot of our coordination with uh, Mr. Adams and his team uh, is about the, these topics. Um, we did, I think, and I think you have heard uh, Director Sartori talk about the MOU that was re recently signed with um, with MCPS um, is really trying to um, make sure that we are coordinating early and often so that our comments are timely and that they can be thought of and incorporated before budgets are set. Thank you. Uh, I have an additional question or two, but I'll yield to colleagues so that we can continue the conversation. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Councilman Robinus. All right. Um, thank you all very much. I want to double tap on Councilmember Jawando's point on the collaboration. I still, and I've talked about this, all of us have, particularly from the 19th Council, one of the most chilling sessions that we had in our first session was seeing the video images of the near misses of children being hit by cars with the newly um, with the, the, the traffic cameras that had been installed on buses. And we saw firsthand, you know, in real time what was happening uh, to our kids. And so um, I, I've really seen some significant progress, uh, and I really greatly appreciate that. And, you know, we're dealing with a, with a growing problem, as we know. The volume of traffic on local roads continues to increase, and these roads were not built for or intended for the type of volume that we are seeing. And there are many reasons for that. Um, construction projects that are happening in and around um, the, the, our, our neighborhoods and communities, such as the Purple Line, which is moving traffic around and flows that were unintended. But Waze, um, Google Maps, um, and people are traveling, you know, in, in, in ways that they never would have before just to get, you know, just two or three minutes quicker from one place to the other. Um, and that's obviously compounding the problem, but, you know, clearly I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. Um, but I wanted to focus my question on sidewalks, and I'm with you, Mr. Adams. I think we've reached a point where, um, we, within reason, um, I think we do need to err much more on the side of building more sidewalks than not. And in the case of Joanne Lelick, I actually have some intel. Um, so I attended a community meeting about a month ago, and I discussed this at a session that we had a few weeks ago, and spoke to um, several of the neighbors who had, you know, presented their concerns with the sidewalk. And, you know, candidly, it was an intense conversation. Uh, they reminded me several times who paid my salary. Um, I got a lot of unsolicited career advice um, in the course of that conversation. Um, but, you know, as we, as, as we sort of sat down and stripped their, their concerns, it, it came down to a few things. One, that there weren't any families 
there weren't any children that attended the school that lived on that block. Um, that, that was one of the arguments that was presented to me. And of course I said, well, that's, I, that may be true, but that won't be true forever. Uh, and you know, the natural cycle of houses being sold and bought means at some point there will be families that live on your block. The second concern was related to landscaping. Um, there were several very mature trees um, that are beloved by the community um, and that would need to be taken down in order for us to be able to accommodate these sidewalks. And they felt that the landscaping plan that had been presented to them in lieu of those concerns was significantly lacking. Um, and that, you know, they were planting small trees that would take 20 or 30 years to mature to the point of the trees that they would be replacing. So that was the second concern. But the third concern was just generally about government, um, feeling like we, we were not being responsive to their needs and that we weren't trying to meet them where they were. So I guess my point with this is, is that um, you all don't have to do this by yourselves. Um, you have a legislative body who is willing to and would like to help in these circumstances. And there may be the opportunity for legislative fixes here that go beyond your all's ability to control because this is a severe problem and what happened this morning underscores that. And we have to take aggressive steps, we all have agreed, um, in order to put our, all of us in a much better position than we are now. Um, and if it's not sidewalks, maybe it's speed bumps. Um, but there have to be practical solutions um, to what we know are very serious problems. The other thing is that, unfortunately, in, you know, it, 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 in some neighborhoods, you've got a handful of people who claim to be speaking for the entire neighborhood, and we, of course, know they are not. And so that is also where use us as leverage um, and, and contact our offices because oftentimes we're familiar with many other families who are frankly the silent majority, um, but afraid of going up against one or two neighbors who uh, you know, they know will, will give them an especially hard time. So I think that's a thread that we should pull further um, beyond this conversation and explore with joint recommendations um, what policy solutions may, we may want to pursue, acknowledging there may be some, some you know, cost issues, but yeah. Yeah, I'd like to say this, and I, I certainly appreciate your monologue, uh, Councilmember Alvin Alves, that's your spot on. And, uh, you know, there's always the, the risk of, of seeking to take a defensive posture when you hear some of the, the information that you've communicated from the community. But I would like to touch on two points. And one is the matter of the trees and perhaps the three trees that we uh, impacted with the project might have been, and I, I wasn't aware that they were like the prize trees, but <laughs> we had significantly reduced uh, the footprint and impact of the sidewalk construction through design to limit it to three trees. And those three trees had, there were, those trees were, uh, there was something wrong with them. They were either diseased or they needed to be removed. So we significantly took a, a good environmental approach when we addressed the concerns of the community. But I think your, your last <coughs> point about utilizing the council is one that we really need to emphasize. And Council Member Mink and her staff stepped in the gap strong and worked with us and partnered with us as we started going through the final stages of this process to, to seek to advance this program. So I, I want to echo what you said, Councilmember Robin House. We do need to engage with you all and, and use you as uh, uh, partners in this matter. And, and we have done that and intend to do that moving forward as well. I, I appreciate that. And where I, I did get traction with this neighbor once they had the opportunity to vent and you know release some of their frustration as part of the job, um, is, you know, explaining to them that this, this volume issue, um, which they, they, they sort of knew inherently but hadn't really focused on. Um, and, you know, they, their children were long out of the house. Um, and so I think it, th there is an opportunity for us to better educate the public because, you know, this does pursue the common good. Um, and I think most people are reasonable. Um, and when you present those types of arguments, not just in statistics and data, but in real life stories, I think that could have make a difference. So I yield back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, really great points. And I just wanna point out that the school bus camera program is working. I tell everybody, mm -hmm. 
I talk to when they complain to me about the cost of the ticket. I tell them we have a recidivism rate. I don't know what it's at now, but it's 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 like less than less than ten percent. You know, uh, last time we had an ENC meeting on it. That means if you get a two hundred fifty dollar ticket, you are less less than ten percent likely to do it again. And that's and that number has continued to go down. So it's 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 working. Um, Council Member Vice President Stewart. Thank you all. Um, just to piggyback on the last point by Council Member Alvinaz, I think, um, and I think most of the people sitting here have heard me say this. Please use our offices um, because um, I worked with each of you, and I think when our offices are involved, um, we can we do reach better outcomes, um, and we can avoid a lot of misinformation um, being put out there. Um, I, I do want to piggyback also on what my colleagues have said about the conversation and coordination. Um, you know, I'm I'm glad to see a lot of more conversation. Um, Director Conklin um, gently talked about it about bumps, bumps in the road <laughs> with Woodland Elementary School, um, and you know that there there were bumps in the road there. I'm glad there's an MOU uh, with planning and MCPS, uh, but I would like to follow up because I think last. Uh, spring when we were talking about the Safe Streets Act, we had a session um, with Public Safety and the T&E um, Committee and uh, talked to MCPS. Uh, and we did talk about other MOUs between um, MCPS, DOT, and the Police Department, uh, because I think all of you right now are are working together and communicating. Um, you are individuals who not, may not always be sitting in the seats you are now sitting in. And I think given how important this is, given um, the budgets that we deal with, given the amount of work everyone is dealing with, we need formalized agreements and processes. So I don't know where some of those other MOUs kind of stand, but can someone give an update? Yeah, so we have a draft we've been working on probably since our, the Safe Routes School Act passed. I actually just got a draft back two hours ago from schools. Um, of course, when you get to the legal side of it, right, that's the always the slowest part. So getting two different sides of lawyers to agree on something can be longer than anyone wants. But uh, we have a draft now. We hope to help have that ready for signature. Um, I don't say a timeline because it has to be reviewed again, but we do have at least both legal counsels have now reviewed a draft. and updated that. That's between MCDOT and MCPS or where's the police? Because I, I remember we were yeah. talking about the transportation, police, and MCPS. Yeah, so it's between, I mean, legally it's between the county government and the county. Okay. Um, that was the legal finding that we can't, as individual departments, enter an MOU. Got it. But um, it does specify the roles of the police, the Department of Transportation, and the schools in terms of crash review and crash sharing information, as well as making sure that there's privacy protections built into that process. Great. Glad to hear that's moving forward. And i spending many years, decades married to a lawyer, I understand. <laughs> um, sometimes these things can, uh, we want them hammered out. And I think that's what's important here, right? Because again, I just really appreciate, uh, because even from, I haven't been here as long as Council Member Albernaz, but I can tell you, I see a difference between over the last year and a half and the communication and appreciate that and just want to make sure we formalize that um, moving forward. Um, the other question I had today, um, and again this goes back to something we talked about um, a few months ago when we were talking about the safe routes to schools and Mr. Keller, I'm so glad that you're talking to school officials and crossing guards. Um, at that time we had talked about also seeing how we could um, branch out into the community a little more. Um, I, I think crossing guards and our school officials are great people to communicate with regarding the safe routes to schools. Uh, in my experience though, they see part of but not the whole like walk shed. Um, you know, we have a limited number of crossing guards um, and where they are near the schools, but nor students are walking. Um, further than we have crossing guards. Um, and at least in my experience, working with a lot of the school officials like at Tilden and other places, they're looking at what's like right around their school and not even like the five blocks like or three blocks away. And so um, as we're looking at always improving and other things, I think pulling in members of the community as we're looking at 
these walk sheds and uh, defining our routes to school would be really helpful. Yeah, thank you, Council, Council Vice President Stewart. That's a great idea and thought. And, you know, we do that as a consequence of being out there. Uh, community members are often curious as to what we're doing, and we do have those conversations, but being more deliberate about it makes plenty of sense, and that's something that we can seek to incorporate into our program. Wonderful. I yield back. Thank you. Just to put a, a fine point on this, and I'm going to go to Councilmember Balcom and then uh, and see if we want to do another round. The uh, MOU, that I'm really glad the tangible progress on that. The request that I made, I'm just going to fine tune it, that we get a comprehensive priority list mm -hmm. that all agencies agree on. Uh, just and that that that's an actual document. I actually I had in my mind that you know once we have it we'd be like oh <laughs> you know like you know but but that kind of uh, to extent the uh, those type of audio learners, um, but that we can work through and because I know there's various lists I've seen them and then the funding we'll fi you know we'll work with you to figure out we can braid that or whichever committee but I think in Mr. Holland your office might be a good coordinator but I I don't it doesn't really matter I just think we need to have that document. Um, Councilmember Balcom. Sure. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, it's a very important topic. And in talking about uh, new schools and coordination for new schools, uh, we had a new school open yesterday, and it was very exciting. Uh, we and I had the opportunity to stand at the door for 45 minutes as the kids were coming in. We had a clap in. It was great. Um, so. <laughs> So I, I know that the school is technically not finished because we've got the auditorium and the gym. So when will the safety measures be installed in terms specifically the crosswalks across Willard? And will there be a sidewalk in front of the school, in front of the, on Willard? So we do have phase two work. I mean, that's a multi-phase project. Um, we obviously are looking at the same issue, and I think there's going to be some temporary measures that we can put in place until we get to the final product on that particular school. I think that's one of those sort of coordination pieces that we do need to, to tighten up on is that as these projects take longer to develop, you know, we, we find ourselves with um, these intermediate states that, that cause some challenges. And Vice, Vice President Stewart knows very well on Silver Spring International navigating that, and that was we see very close coordination with with police and transportation around what are some of the temporary things we can do mm -hmm. until we get to the final product. But we do have a very similar situation at Poolsville High School. And will there be a sidewalk on Willard? So, so I, I believe we're going to have a partial sidewalk. We have to look to see yeah. if it's going to continue as far as I, I believe there were questions about. I, I don't know the yeah, answer And I that. think that the partial sidewalk would work on you know on the school side because there aren't uh, there the the kids are coming from the other side of Willard, uh, but it's it's just very difficult to navigate that. Um, and I think that um, I I just really urge that we get some temporary measures because. Um, it now granted it was the first day of the school and you know there more there were probably more parents dropping kids off and it was rainy so there were more cars but um, it's a it's a very significant chokehold and it's bumper to bumper for probably 30 minutes and there's there's just no access for the kids the kids really are darting between cars and, and also two-way traffic because parents are dropping off and then they're circling back and coming back the other way. So uh, whatever we can do, um, I, and, I, and I think it, I've been in touch with the principal um, and he really needs that help right now. So appreciate it. And I'm thrilled about the school. So thank you. Um, just from a perspective of the... Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was just going to ask for clarification. Where exactly is the school so I can make the district? So it's on, it's on Willard Road. Uh -huh. um, in Poolsville. Poolsville. Okay. I'm sorry, Poolsville yeah, yeah. High School. Okay. Yeah. That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, did it, were other schools open yesterday? <laughs> that would be great. Uh, but thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so it's the safe routes to schools, I, I, I agree with. Um, my colleagues in terms of coordination um, with 
uh, with the district offices in terms of you know what's going to happen at sidewalks or intersections and when that work takes place because um, just as you're getting calls we get those calls as well so appreciate that and um, great point from uh, Vice President Stewart in terms of formal coordination um, and and this group has done a great job of coordination and um, so it, as formal as that can be that that's a legacy that you can leave going forward and, and improve upon so I appreciate that uh, so I've I've made this point before and um, and I know that it's a funding issue but if we're doing 20 audits a year and we have hundred and thirty three schools left to go that's six years and I'm concerned about, uh, of course, I mean, that's why we're here. We're concerned about the safety. So could we do some uh, rapid task force of looking at just eyeballing every single school to make sure that there's not something that jumps out that you know, if an accident occurs three years from now at, a, at, at an intersection that we could have simply fixed, but we, but it, we didn't get to it yet. I, I, just, I just feel like there's got to be some way to have a, eyeballs on every single school. And thank you, Councilmember Balcom. It, when you first uh, talked about having sort of a, a, a task force that, that did that quickly, you piqued my interest and I started thinking about that. And, and then when you finished talking, I arrived at the conclusion that that's kind of what we're doing with things when we look at the, the walk shed assessment, that we are trying our best to get out there and look at what we believe might be features that need to be modified and enhanced by safety treatments such as traffic control devices mm -hmm. or other. And unfortunately, the, I guess the devil's in the details. Sometimes it's not as simple as looking at what we might consider an overt safety issue, but there is the underlying safety issue that needs more percolation on as we do our site visits that we say, oh my gosh, we didn't realize this would be such a complication and result in some kind of safety detriment. So when we're doing our, our walk shed assessments, that's what we discover. And I, I, I don't envision that if we tried to, to find some kind of um, quick fix, and I don't mean to say it that way because sure, it I sounds understand. more negative. But but I don't I don't know that that's that that's the opportunity, especially when we're looking at a as expansive a walk shed as mm -hmm. we're looking at. You know, we're not talking about one short stretch of roadway, but we're talking about a bunch of roadways connected in a a walk shed of of, of several hundred feet or several hundred acres or something like that. Okay. So. I appreciate that. Um, and then I, I mentioned this before, and I'm sure you, you're looking at this, is the, the difference between the formal route to school versus the route that the kids actually walk to school. And I think that that, and I'm assuming you're looking at that in your audits. Consequently, yes. And so we're looking at every possible location route um, aside from uh, Somebody's backyard. I, I, and, and, and of course we know from some of the, the constituent concerns that we've heard, mm -hmm. those are some routes that are occurring and, and children don't take traditional routes. So it's, as much as it's practical, we are looking at every avenue, but some of those uh, avenues, the dirt paths and, and the secret paths behind the, the neighborhood, um, those might escape our gaze, but there is only limited opportunities for us to improve those. So that's yeah. the challenge there. Yeah, I appreciate that. And then just lastly, um, the state roads. You know, I think that that's, um, if, if we can get uh, some level of communication in, in, that, in that regard. We, we looked at that when we did the safe, the safe streets and there's some coordination, uh, but you know, I have five high schools in my district and four of them are on state roads. Um, so I think that that's just a piece that we, we need to continue to um, determine how we can partner with, uh, with, the, with the state. So um, I appreciate all your work. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councilman Balcom. I, I will mention that when we sped up the walk, we actually doubled, the, I think, the ability for you to do those faster. Those, it was happening. It was going to be 12 years or something. <laughs> so I, it's, it's context is important. I, it, I agree it's not fast enough. Yeah. But the other issue was, I think, also the capacity with which you had to analyze them, like the, the people you work with to do. How long do those take, just to, for context? Typically, I know it depends on the school, but yeah, it does depend on the school, uh, Councilmember Jawando. But you know, again, we're looking at <laughs> one or two a month because of the amount of field uh, reconnaissance that needs to take place, and then of course documenting the the, the findings and then submitting the reports. So. And do you have outside vendors that you work with? We do. do you yes, sir. Internal. We, one of the things I know we, we have talked about before, and you can go back if you like. I don't know how many people are in this space, but if we did have a supercharge, mm -hmm. you know, if we found a pot of money, like how fast could you do it? And I know there's always the secondary question of then, well, how do you get to the fixes? But then I think that goes back to where I started on the prioritization of like, we need all the information across all the agencies and, and then, and also from the schools themselves. Right, like, you know, so when the principal would go back, you know, gives me that information where they know, like, this is a problem every day. How does that get from you, Mr. At or from MCPS to DOT, you know, to the police, to the crossing guards? There's, you know, there's that. But if you could, you can answer now, but if there's a way to, uh, if you could with more money, get more contractors and do it quickly, we would want to know that, you know. The answer is yes. Okay. The complication is timing. So when we look at or perform walkshed assessments, we typically assign these assessments a three-year shelf life. We're assuming that the community dynamic is going to change significantly uh, in the next three years, such that if we were able to perform right. uh, a great number of walkshed right. assessments at some right. point in time, say this is no longer valid and we'd have to do it again so if we don't get the construction done within the three-year period then we would assume that there are features that have changed walking you know, origin destination movements things like that so the balance that we're trying to strike is how many can we get done and do we comfortably believe the shelf life is still in place so that we can construct it and not miss some new features that might arise? So that would be the, the risk that we might want to consider assuming sure. to say, all right, we're just going to go ahead and do it. And maybe there are some things that we might not catch during construction and we have to wait until the next cycle around. But then it depends on how significant that, that item is that's been omitted. So OK, well, that's something to follow up on. I'll turn to my co-chair, Councilor McCarthy. Oh, I'm sorry, Seth. Yeah, then, then we'll turn it to Councilor And just one comment to that, because I think even today's uh, Baker Middle School uh, piece, right? So there's there's pieces that are outside of the walk shed. That is outside of the walk shed. Right. So mm -hmm. um, a strong suggestion, and this is from the school's perspective, if you can fund the police, no one has ever said extra crossing guards are a bad thing. Yeah. So, you know, some of these some of these projects take time. They will take time. So if there's opportunities to think intro. about what is the yeah. intermediate step, um, we w schools would strongly recommend looking at the police department in terms of the crossing guard program as a stopgap until we are able to, to get some of this infrastructure done. That's great. Councilman Robin, go ahead. Um, thank you. I just, I, I, I just thought about the um, crossing guards. I thought about that yesterday. It's a high school, and I know you typically don't have crossing guards at high school, but that could be an intermediate step for Poolsville. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Glass. Uh, thank you. So uh, it, it's been brought up a few, a few times, um, the absence of SHA from this conversation. Um, so clearly, as we, as we uh, have continued discussions about coordination, uh, we need to bring them into the conversation. Uh, and I know that there has been an evolution within SHA dating back, you know, the last six, seven years. Uh, and uh, they are making progress, and we need them to make more, and they, we need them to be partners with us in the planning stage and the implementation phase as well. So, uh, uh, so putting a pin on that. Uh, the, the last question I have um, goes back to the uh, funding for reviews and, and infrastructure. And in the Safe Streets Act, we had a, a very lengthy debate about schools. And 
uh, what the parameters were that would uh, trigger a review and, and how far away recognizing our schools are all uh, geographically different um, and the population density uh, is, is different. So uh, just a few months ago, we approved a, a supplemental uh, to support the implementation of the Safe Streets Act. Uh, and so I'm curious uh, uh, to our DOT friends, uh, have there been any uh, infrastructure reviews with regard to school zones as, as noted in the law for the Safe Streets Act just yet? Yeah, I'm not aware that there have been any reviews. There was, uh, I know there was a crash that occurred proximal to a school, but it didn't qualify. And I can't give you the details. I apologize for that. No, uh, and, and again, we had a very, uh, a very lengthy discussion about what would qualify not only the radi radius around the school, uh, but also uh, who that person might be and the hours of and, and right, right. And so if there has been no infrastructure review yet, then that means that such an incident has not yet occurred, which is a good thing. That in conjunction with the need to do other reviews, as my colleagues have noted, right, we can, we can uh, do all that we have the ability and resources to do, uh, but if, if something has not been triggered, that speaks for itself. Yeah, Mr. Holland. Yeah, and um, one of the things that we had a robust work group going before the begin before you know, the end of 2023, developing a whole systematic approach between police and DOT and also our SHA partners and municipalities, so there's some involvement there. The challenge was that we had a complete change in our data systems for crash records statewide, so until we get that data feedback up online, that does slow down that process. But when we do are aware of crashes, like you said, the one this morning, the one that was involving, um, forgetting the school, but we, if we know that they're available, they will, police will forward the reports to DOT so we can do those analysis. And it's not part of the formal, formal process we're trying, trying to build out, but when we are aware of those while the data feed is being rebuilt, uh, but that is still coming. Uh, thank you, Mr. Holland. As I noted earlier, you know, some of the questions verge on operating and CIP. The point that you just raised about the new software and the inability to get some of that data, uh, I have on my list. I'll save it for the operating budget. Uh, mm -hmm. So we'll tee up that first question at another time. But appreciate all of all of you participating in this conversation. Appreciate the uh, Education and, and Culture Committee, um, the unfortunate timeliness of this discussion with what happened in Damascus only underscores the importance of this discussion, the need for even greater coordination, and the additional resources to make that work, um, to, to implement that work. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and we, we don't just preach it, we practice it. We're going to coordinate more between our committees and our council to, uh, I'm, I'm sure I, the co-chair would agree to bring this, these issues back. Uh, we have several kind of things we've asked for follow-up on and lists. Um, uh, just before we transition to our second item, the police on the crossing guards, you said 175 of 185 were filled. Is that what you said? It's 183, and we have three emergency backup positions. Okay. Is that enough? Um, I mean, I, I think Did we you have always analysis like to, I mean, obviously we always want more, but I mean, like, you know, we yeah. have 211 schools, you know, I, I kind of ask it rhetorically, you can answer anything, but we, let's find out. Let's, that's part of the work too, is with, with what Mr. Adams just said in MCPS, we, I think we, the on the ground information could help us determine that answer. Yeah, we try to plan ahead. We try to get uh, ahead of when there's a new, new school being constructed. Um, when there's being one being renovated and you're relocating to another uh, location to analyze how many more guards are we going to need, uh, and we do put that in the budget. Um, we don't always get what what we ask for sometimes, but yeah, I think we should uh, come back to you with a, a, a definitive amount, perhaps. Something to discuss as we go yeah. into the operating budget. Um, and you know, that's, I think and, there would be broad agreement on that. And those are ever changing for the reasons that you all have pointed out. Like one, one year you might have in a, in a neighborhood 50 families with kids going to school, walking, right. and then the next year it might be cut in half. So those, those guard locations and needs change constantly. So we can't rely yeah. on Adrian Danley forever. This is, this is very true. This is very true. <laughs> Not many people know who he is. I know. Well, anymore, but I'm, just that, I'm just going to leave that there uh, yeah. and, and let people go Google it. But um, thank you very much. Uh, we really appreciate all thank the you. coordination, and we'll, we will come back to these issues. So thank you all very much. Um,
We'll now transition uh, to our second item, uh, which is a discussion and action on CIP items related to the Ride on Transit Center and the MCPS bus depot relocation projects. Um, so if you're Mr. Asant, I see, and so our partners from MCPS can stay, and then uh, DGS, and I think we also have DOT still here as well. So Ms. McGuire, I will turn it over to you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so as you said, um, I know you're passionate about this project. <laughs> I am passionate about the bus depot and I will work to uh, contain, uh, my <laughs> contain my remarks. Um, as many people know, I've been working on this issue for a very, very, very long time. Uh, and uh, so I'm happy to be here today in terms of being able to bring forward uh, a new concept for um, for this space um, and many of the folks that are here at the table and behind me have also been working on this issue for a very 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 long time uh, so again this is an issue that has uh, been been um, tried to be uh, tackled from a very uh, broad number of angles um, so I will not go through all of the tortured history but I will just say briefly that um, what you have in front of you today are two uh, separate but related CIP projects related to the same property and that property is um, the uh, currently the MCPS uh, transportation depot at Shady Grove which is also on um, Crabs Branch that property uh, was once upon a time uh, in the early 2000s actually a lot of light industrial uses of county government um, there the county fleet was there also the school systems food um, food service facility maintenance facilities were there and of course uh, in 2006 the council did adopt a sector plan for that area that called uh, with with uh, appropriately enough for um, non-industrial and residential and other uses to be located near the transit center and the metro station that is there and so that certainly uh, has been the driving vision of that area and has been again the work of everyone that you see here uh, and others to relocate the county light industrial functions that were on that area um, unfortunately, uh, the last one that has not been able to be relocated is again the school's transportation depot. What we have um, today that the executive branch has put forward is uh, a concept plan that does um, dramatically improve the conditions um, of that property and how it is being used at this moment. Um, I'll let Mr. Assant speak more to the to the proposed plan, but the idea um, and the concept is to really consolidate and reorient um, the the public infrastructure functions that are there on that property, um, have them oriented more to the rear of the property. I believe the approach also would separate um, the large vehicle bus access from the residential access, and importantly, it would free up a great deal of that footprint for the kinds of uses that, of course, the master plan envision, uh, the mixed use development and other um, amenities that are necessity that are necessary for that community and again called for um, in given the proximity to transit. Um, all of the references that I made to having worked on this for a long time are really just a reference to the fact that it's very difficult to relocate um, uh, a public infrastructure function of this size um, and that has been our challenge over these years I think that this represents a really important first uh, not first a really important step forward um, to improve the property again um, improve the conditions for the residents and begin to make progress on the infrastructure challenge um, the primary uh, thought I would want to leave the committees with um, today is that again as important as this is it will not solve the infrastructure challenge and so we will have to continue to work um, towards that end to solve the infrastructure challenges of both the ride on fleet and the MCPS fleet going forward um, so uh, council staff will conclude remarks at this time the PDFs uh, in front of you from the executive put forward uh, planning dollars to really again 
take a uh, creative scoping approach to the project to work with the community around that effort and then um, following on to that to begin the preliminary design. So there's a significant amount of uh, funding in both projects. Council staff's primary recommendation in addition to supporting the dollars is to add language to both projects that connect the projects and also um, provide opportunities for the council to receive more regular reports through the process um, with this project. Thank you, Ms. McGuire. Uh, and as you noted, this is something that the community has been very interested in for a long time. And uh, it's good that we're, while not completely solving the problem, moving, taking a, what I think is a giant step forward. Um, so I think what we'll do is uh, maybe hear from Mr. Assant on the particulars, and then I'll turn to my co-chair and then colleagues that have questions, and then we can move to a vote. Great. Good afternoon, Greg Austin, Department of General Services. And again, uh, uh, such a thorough packet, uh, a lot of history here. Um, I can tell you, just, just to uh, dispose of some administrative stuff, we're going to be fine with the staff's recommendations. Uh, there's some language that was introduced. We've reviewed it. We're going to be fine with that if, if, that's, the, if the, that's the collective committee's uh, uh, recommendation or, or desire. Um, and I'm going to steal some of Ms. McGuire's language here down at the bottom of page two. To consolidate and reorient the public infrastructure use of the current property in a manner that maximizes the intent of the sector plan, including mixed-use development and other amenities for the surrounding community. I couldn't have captured it better myself. That is exactly the task that we've outlined for our consultant uh, that we just brought on and who will kick off a series of public engagement um, this month. Um, we should have a, uh, and I'll uh, talk a little bit about uh, the charge of that consultant in a moment, but um, really to focus on what the money's for and what's in front of you is these two CIP projects is recognition of two separate projects in two different portfolios, both DGS and DOTs, but we're really working on the same effort. So we're going to pool our resources. Uh, we, we, both departments have a lot of work to do. Um, as you see in all of our capital projects, DGS likes to, likes to characterize our client departments, um, who we're working for. In this case, it's both MCDOT and their ride-on program in the future of transit in Montgomery County, but also MCPS. Um, and we've been working side by side with Mr. Adams and his team, um, and actually preceding Mr. Adams and, and uh, uh, his, his, his predecessors, um, and predecessors, predecessors for that matter, um, uh, for a long time trying to find a solution to all this. So really DGS, in DGS mind, we have two clients. Um, but uh, more importantly, and back to the, the, the engagement piece of this, which is what the initial funding will be for, is making sure that we're engaged in the community. Um, we now have a very different dynamic than, than where we started 15 years ago before all of these uses were transferred from Crabs Branch, both the east and west sides, uh, to other places in the county. And uh, we have a, a new neighborhood, the west side at Shady Grove. I'm sure you've all been to the ribbon cuttings for some of the multifamily projects that HOC and EYA have collaborated on. It's a great community, and they want to know when the buses are going to be uh, moving from, uh, from across the street, as they were promised when they bought their houses. Uh, but more importantly, the greater Durwood community, um, folks that have been participating in this process, Shady Grove Sector Plan is 2006. I was just uh, talking to Dave Hondowitz out in the hallway. He and I were talking about this 20 years ago. Um, and so uh, there's, a, there's a lot of history here and a lot of folks who lived in that neighborhood when we still had those industrial uses there are, are just as interested in seeing those buses go away as, as, um, as, as the folks who, who have moved in there uh, more recently. Um, again, back to uh, what we plan to do. So we brought on a consultant, uh, Design Collective. Um, their charge is twofold. Uh, the first and foremost, they'll engage um, uh, the community and uh, what we're calling stakeholder engagement. Um, that's going to include, obviously, our public sector stakeholders, but also the community uh, uh, in large. Um, we will have a dedicated website. Um, we will have a kickoff, public kickoff meeting hosted by the county uh, at the end of this month. Um, but this will really kick off a, uh, basically a six-month process. Um, with different visioning exercises, very similar to what a sector plan engagement process that park and planning, we've kind of modeled it after that so that we're uh, getting uh, basically best in, uh, the best uh, opportunities to, to seek all that input. 
that those efforts um, and uh, we'll begin this month as I said um, we'll get dates out I actually just looked at the prototype for the website it'll be interactive it'll be um, populated with a lot of information it will not be the typical DGS project page where you have to go to Montgomery County and then find DGS or DOT and then figure that part out it'll have its dedicated website we'll, we'll, we'll have Q, uh, QR codes all the, the, the customary um, um, ways to find it um, and uh, so, so that'll kick kick off uh, this month, um, continue into the summer, uh, all culminating probably at some point after Labor Day, um, and uh, with an uh, with an ending report, a deliverable from the consultant that will consolidate all of the information that we've obtained from the community, all of the visioning uh, 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 exercises and and outreach activities, uh, put that all together um, in a nice neat pack it and, and uh, really refine what is a concept, refine it into a concept plan. Uh, so that's, the, that's uh, what we plan to do over the next four or five months. Concurrently, and you'll hear from schools and, and DOT today as well, uh, they have a lot of technical work that they need to do. And I'll let Chris uh, Conklin, uh, Director of DOT, talk about uh, the technical work that they, that they need to do um, as it relates to providing us with the feedback that we need in order to design a co-located facility uh, that will accommodate both ride-on and, uh, sorry, should have, should have uh, recognized Maricela, who's, gonna, who's probably going to answer the questions, but Chris is here as well. Um, but uh, in addition to that, we, we uh, uh, Seth Adams with MCPS, of course, uh, speaking to their operation. These are both very complex operations. We're proposing to co-locate them in a public facility and then surround that facility with mixed-use development. So this is a, a pretty daunting task. Uh, the technical teams need the opportunity to provide us with the information that we need in order to figure this thing out. Um, and, and so that's what they're going to be doing uh, throughout the, the balance of, of the community engagement uh, activities. Um, I'll hit the pause button there, um, and that's a quick intro. Um, that's what the money is for. Um, the, the only thing I would add as it relates to the CIP projects generally is uh, we're obviously not going to spend all of the money that you see here. There's about $3.5 million in, in commensurate in DOT's budget. That is not intended to just cover the community engagement. What we intend to do is cover a lot of different activities as part of that, and then ultimately um, if the concept plan has legs, at the end of this process, we want to be able to immediately roll into preliminary design uh, without having to come back, uh, suggest a new capital project, wait until the, those deliberations this time next year to hit a start button in the following July. That is not the intent. So we've been strategic here. We've given ourselves a little bit of uh, lead, uh, lead resources to start that preliminary engineering um, if, if, in fact, this is a successful venture over the next four to five or six months. Thank you. Thank you for that overview. Uh, just want to acknowledge Councilmember Lukey sent a memo to the joint committees asking for us to approve this, these monies. This is obviously impacting uh, her district as well as, uh, but it really is one of the things that impacts the whole county, right? You know, there's 14, almost 1,500 school buses and I don't know how many ride-ons that's in the packet, but uh, Director Conklin. Well, as, as many as 225. Yeah, 225 buses. So, and, and obviously this whole, whole, right now there's the Shady Grove spot doesn't hold all the school buses and they, you know, that are allocated. There's not enough spots for all of them. So this is, to your point, is very technical. Um, so I will turn to my co-chair and then if colleagues have questions. Oh, great. Uh, thank you for the presentation. This is exactly the kind of creative thinking we need to uh, reimagine this parcel. Uh, and quite frankly, the, the parcel's already been reimagined. It was reimagined back in 2006. So this is bringing it to fruition. And as we recognize we're in a housing crisis, more transit-oriented development um, at this location uh, makes complete sense. And I'll, I'll add and appreciate MCDOT uh, being here, um, Ms. Ms. Cordova and Mr. McLaughlin as well, um, that the new bus depot for our Department of Transportation is incredibly needed to meet our zero emission goals as well. So it does meet the school goals, it does meet our housing and uh, redevelopment goals, but it meets our environmental goals. And so this is a win all across the board. I'm hopeful that these funds uh, will 
find um, positive solutions with these consultants. I think we're all going to be holding on hope um, that it'll all work out, but this is the first step to making that positive change, so I support this. Uh, appreciate the district council members' um, advocacy since before she even got sworn in. Um, she and I, I remember, uh, were walking around that area, um, and, and the residents were talking about it. Delegate Von Stewart was there as well, um, talking about that area, and, and so uh, support this. Glad we're moving forward, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Um, I will turn to uh, the committee, and then I'll, Councilmember Lukey, if you want to make a comment, I'll turn first to Councilmember Baucom. Um, thank you, uh, and I'm. I haven't been involved as long as, as Ms. McGuire, but, um, uh, or many of you, I hear. Um, so do we have any idea of how much this is going to cost? And, uh, you know, this funding is for planning uh, and feasibility planning. Have you looked at any kind of idea of how much this is going to cost? So the, the, we don't have an all-in number at this point. That's part of where we would we would propose to go as part of this, the technical work that needs to happen. Um, uh, and I'll let DOT speak to some of their preliminary studies and understandings. Um, but, uh, you know, we're in the hundreds of millions of dollars in terms of a solution. Um, the MTOC facility just directly across the street, uh, which is remarkably a similar uh, facility, um, back when we constructed that, I believe was was tilting around the hundred million dollar mark. Um, uh, as part of the the public facility, um, we're also intending to make it a microgrid, um, so that we, we both both agencies will have will be all EV. Uh, as Council Member Glass pointed out, this is all towards a, a zero emission effort. So uh, all of the retrofitting of our current depots that we've been doing down in Littonsville and, and also about to uh, take on an, at MTOC, we would do that out of the gate at this facility. Mm -hmm. And so this would be a, a, a microgrid in addition to the depot itself. Um, so it, it's, there are different pieces of it. They're all very expensive, um, but we don't want to sugarcoat that. We're, we're going to be in a different stratosphere here. Um, so uh, one of the other uh, activities that we'll be working on, not immediately, but soon thereafter, will be uh, bringing on another consultant to uh, help us uh, take the temperature of the market. Um, we're obviously going to need a P3 partner in all of this. Uh, there's no question that we can't fit a multi-hundred million dollar project in the CIP in the next 10 years to meet that 2030 goal to have this facility operation in 2030. Uh, so we'll be doing that as well. That's some of the DGS technical work that's going to be going on um, in addition to the community engagement. But uh, it, you know, we will have a number at some point, um, but uh, the, the expectation is that there will be federal uh, funding available for the DOT portion of it. I'm not sure what is available for the for the MCPS portion of it. Um, uh, power purchase agreements and other P3s for the energy piece of this, and then there's mm -hmm. the facility itself. So it will be a very complex um, package, but that is, again, what we intend to bring back to you. Um, uh, you know, after after Labor Day, as we, as we wrap up work on, on this initial phase, and as as Ms. McGuire mentioned, uh, one of the recommendations is to come back monthly. We don't have any issue doing that. Um, there's going to be enough community engagement activities that you should be updated um, regularly and probably more frequently than monthly. But nevertheless, we don't have any issues with providing a, a monthly written report, and some of that will pertain to um, our efforts to to seek a P3 partnership at some point. Okay, thank you. Thank great you. question and great context. Just so we go in eyes wide open. Two, yes, Director. Two Conner. elements I'd like to add to what Mr. Assant said. One of the important things we need to get done in the early phases of this work or get a clearance under the National Environmental Policy Act so that we can find that the facility doesn't have any detrimental environmental impact and then qualify to use federal funding quickly. The bus and bus facilities program is ideally suited to this type of project. Um, those applications for this round are due this month, so we're not obviously applying now because we don't have the legwork done. But the concept is that if we work on the schedule, we will be in perfect position to apply for those funds in the next cycle of funding uh, at this time next year. And we can also phase the facility to some extent um, to match the fiscal capacity that might be available to support it. And those are things that we need to work through as part of this planning exercise. Appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Lukey. 
Thank you. Um, I thank all of you. Um, and, and some of us were in the hearing this morning where we also got to see Council Member Katz react with great glee over this in, in much the same way that that Ms. McGuire did, um, because this has been a long time coming. And I really appreciate, one, that it's a significant, as you've noted, will require some P3 partnership to, to really make this work, um, but that it touches upon policy goals, both of this council and of the state, in terms of environmental, in terms of housing capacity, in terms of transit-oriented development. Um, and and so I think it's incredibly critical that we do fund this um, and and I so appreciate your willingness to take the recommendation to provide monthly updates as well. I, I know the community is very engaged. I know they will continue to be incredibly engaged in this process and in the um, stakeholder meetings that are going to be coming up as, as we have discussed over the next six months. Um, but you know that that feedback will be critical for all of us as as a body to understand as well, not just for me as a as the district council member. So um, I greatly appreciate that. And um, you know, right now this community has been waiting since two thousand six with a promise, right? And they very much view it as a promise. And um, the proposed projects that combine on this site um, to, to take care of a host of things along with things we know that are in the works and can be uh, further uh, worked on with developers in that area will help bring to the greatest extent possible that sector plan to life. Um, and so I, you know, I just want to make that clear. It, it's not that everything will be exactly as somebody envisioned in 2006 because it's 2024. Um, that being said, that's what the community's involvement is about, and listening to them now and understanding their needs now and what can be um, in light of where we are going forward as a, as a county and as a state. So thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Luki. Uh, Councilmember Albernaz. Uh Thanks. This definitely does demonstrate progress. I, I was there for a number of these conversations. I know that no stone has been unturned, you know, looking for different locations for bus depots across the entire county and it's just shocking that nobody wants them in their backyard <laughs> um, but but I do think that um, this is an ambitious project um, and I think we can't let perfect be the enemy of the good here um, because I've seen with the best of intentions us try to throw everything in the kitchen sink and other projects before which ends up delaying them even longer and so uh, you know, that's just obviously something we'll take into consideration as we move forward. Um, but I clearly support this recommendation and I will be tracking it closely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Vice President Stewart. Great. Um, thank you. And I'm glad that we got a little bit of a preview of this um, this morning at Government Operations and Fiscal Policy. So I think almost our whole council <laughs> has been uh, given a bit of an update on this project, which I think is really important. Um, and I do think it's an opportunity, as Council Member Lukey said, and uh, Mr. Sant, as you said, um, to to do this from scratch, right? Um, and to look at a microgrid and some of the other things that you're looking at, some of our other depots of retrofitting. Um, and, you know, I, I did have the opportunity to travel with the uh, county executive to um, Taiwan and go to the sustainability, the Smart Cities Conference there. And one of the things that, um, I saw there were, um, you know, not just EV buses, uh, but um, uh, EV buses that were also, I'm sorry, it's been a really long day, the uh, <laughs> self-driving. Uh, and not that I'm promoting self-driving buses uh, on our streets, but the thing they were talking about is parking of buses and how the self-driving can be used to help park buses and save space and time of uh, drivers. Um, and so anyway, I just think this is um, an opportunity to, to look at all those things um, and I appreciate all the work that has been done and look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, and I just heard something about that Waymo is going to start testing in D.C. this summer, you know, self, one of the self-driving cars. So um, I did have one question before we take a vote um, and uh, on the I alluded to this earlier that, you know, obviously 50, almost 1,500 buses in the MCPS fleet. 
all of the depots, Randolph, Clarksburg, they're all over capacity, as Mr. Adams knows. There's not enough spots already. Uh, with the idea that we're combining, pushing this back, and I agree it's a great concept, uh, what ideas do you have to deal with the additional MCPS buses? Because obviously they're not going to be able to, you're not going to be able to do the ride on and MC, that's not going to be able to solve it. So what concepts are you thinking about for that? Right. Um, both with the, the what, what ride on's identified as the 250, 55, 55. number, combined with what's out there currently today, which I think those numbers in your packet, yeah. there's, there's room for X and there's actually this many out there. So it's even worse than, than what it's, desi that it's currently designed right. for. Right, it would be worse. Right, yeah, so yeah, I yeah. think, you know, <laughs> we, in, in, in having preliminary conversations with the community, we've kind of provided them with two assurances that, that we, as we move forward with this, and that we're going to EV, and so um, the, the, there won't be a, this isn't a, the same operation that they've been seeing for years and years and years across the on street. On both sides, on the um, MCPS on both sides. side. That's the right, right. Yeah. We're, bo yeah. we're both, we're both, both agencies are aligned on that. Um, but more importantly, um, the idea here is to, to uh, and it, this is in the packet as well, but to push the facility back towards the rear of the site and utilize some of the existing roadway infrastructure on the back of the site to get uh, vehicles in and out of this facility. Um, so that, um, and I think Mr. Dice alluded to this earlier today, that you're not seeing school buses or ride-on buses on Crabs Branch ever again unless they're picking up kids for school or dropping them off or at a ride-on spot where they're supposed to be. That the, that the, the public uh, infrastructure, the industrial type uses will go in and out of the rear of the site and it won't impact the community the way that it does today. It's a, it's a very impactful uh, morning and afternoon uh, with the school buses there currently. Um, and in doing so, um, and the other part that we've kind of assured is we, the, the overall capacity for these facilities may have a number that's well over 600 buses, but I don't think that we can plan to enclose bus parking for that many uh, buses um, at this site without using the entire site, which is not the intent. Uh, the intent is to wrap the site with mixed-use development. Um, uh, there's a four acre park and a four acre school site and so we want to stay as close and as true to the master plan as we possibly can uh, so by no means are we suggesting that we just dedicate all 40 45 acres here for a bus depot and just enclose some of it and call it a day that is not the intent the intent is to get the mixed use out of it so all that to answer your question councilmember Jawando is uh, we are not intending to have a huge parking complement. There will, we will need to have parking for buses. We don't know exactly what that number is. We need to do some design work. But you're right, um, we're not going to add insult to injury and compound an already existing uh, basically out of bounds uh, number that's currently out there and exacerbate that with 250 more ride on buses and try to make a go of it. That is not the intent here. So there would need to obviously be another, so again, this we, as we've talked about, this is a part of a solution this is, that's improving a problem, but we're yeah. going to need to find yeah, and spots. The, the, and, yeah, and, 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 and as he's packet uh, talks, alludes to this, and gets into a little bit of detail, and we'll need to talk more about it because uh, Mr. Adams will let him speak for himself, but they have a lot he's of initiatives. on the button. A lot, of, <laughs> a lot of initiatives underway, a lot of studies underway, and this is something that we've all been well aware of and, and, and know that needs to be solved in conjunction with some of this. So it needs to be a comprehensive solution. Appreciate that. Mr. Adams. No, thank you, uh, Mr. Asad. The, uh, the, the piece around the, on page five of the packet, too, does talk about the MCPS CIP and money that was put forward for a study to start looking at existing secondary schools. So again, that's, that's going to be a study to look at um, modifications at existing schools to be able to park, park buses at those locations. This is all part of the, you know, the electrification of the bus fleet. Um, so things we'll look at is, you know, pretty much everything we talked about earlier, right? You know, the, the stormwater management, forest conservation, and even we found that in some of these neighborhoods, um, the electrical grid can't support, you know, the electrification of both buildings and buses. So we're gonna go through a study to really look at what this means for our, our, our school sites, um, but it is going to be a close, uh, it's gonna be a very close combination coordination effort between the, the piece we talked about earlier, where, mm. you know, we, we wanna make sure you know, pedestrian, bicycle safety, two schools is, is where it needs to be, but also then increasing more 
bus traffic and, and other uh, vehicular traffic on, on some of our school sites. So in tandem to the work that you know uh, will be happening in DGS, we will be looking at each of our school sites, secondary school sites, for maximizing school bus parking at those locations as well. So just that's, that's the, probably not going to be a crowd pleaser either, right? You know, whether it's a large depot or you're adding anywhere from 30 to 40 buses to on a middle school or on, high school on a middle site. or high school site, yeah. it's it's unfortunately where we are in terms of trying to find space for for our, our bus fleet. And obviously, and go ahead, Miss McGuire. Yeah. No, I didn't interrupt you. I, I was just, just going to say it ties to the like you said the earlier conversation of making sure people to get to and from school safely, you got to add more bus traffic and all. Go ahead. No, exactly. And again, you know, certainly that's an important component. I mean, we are, and again, having been through this process and looked at literally everything under every rock, um, it, it is going to be an all solution um, and an all possibilities solution. Parking at schools may be an important part of that to help alleviate pressure. But again, that will not solve uh, the level of infrastructure problem that we have here and the level that, again, we anticipate our system to continue to grow. It is proving that it is continuing to grow, which means there's more buses that go with that. And so, again, just um, keeping those efforts uh, on the front burner to continue to look for um, alternatives uh, to be able to alleviate the capacity of this fleet across uh, going forward. Yep. Absolutely, but uh, not not solving everything. But this is a good, important step in members of that community. Yes, uh, Councilmember Bravo. Um, thank you. Um, so I I was intrigued by the con the concept of parking in the secondary schools, and I and uh, appreciate that you know it's we have to study and see if that works. Um, the timing works in that the buses will be the buses are going to be picked up long before school starts and then it's they're not coming back until after school is in in session i i would only suggest that when you look at that assessment of which schools are appropriate um you look at the um the traffic capacity and commuting capacity in general so if if it's some if a, there's a, a road infrastructure that's busy at 6 30 in the morning it would be very difficult to add 30 buses coming and going from there. So I'm assuming that's part of the feasibility study. Yes, this will be a robust, you know, traffic and, and uh, traffic study work that's involved. But I, I think too, though, looking at it from electric fleet, you know, we, we also have to account for them coming to, to get a charge midday. You know, those those sorts of things. So it's it's a little more complicated than than sort of just sparking them after school hours and then leaving. There's there's definitely going to be a, a a dance of what that means to, to school operations during the day, and then obviously um, what it means for community use of these facilities afterwards. But absolutely, traffic um, traffic impact studies will be a big part of that work. Thank you. Yeah, one of the when I read that in the packet, one of the first things I thought I was like, shoot, my spot when I go to a school for an event. Yeah, I know. I, you know, I often mm -hmm. am pull, I'm often encouraged to pull up into the bus spots, um, you know, that are not there. But that you know, that's that could that could be definitely going away. But but we got to figure it out. Price of living in the in the big city. Uh, exactly. Um, are you, all right, Mr. Chair? All right. So uh, with that, uh, we have a before us two uh, CIP projects. The executive has recommended uh, funding um, for them both, as we've discussed. And uh, uh, for those on the committee, uh, you can take a vote. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And Mr. council Warren. staff is also recommending the addition of the language to both. PBS. Yes, and that would include. Thank you. Uh, include the planning language, uh, the fun to come back to the committees, the language that's in the packet that Ms. McGuire included that DGS thankfully said they were good to comply with. So awesome. Uh, so with that, I think we are we are done. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.